Uh, obviously, we're in an active construction zone. And with the uh, things that happen with the city of Sunline Park, we've been uh, adjusting on the fly all morning. Uh, I know a lot of you guys are probably wondering what the resolution is and what the process looked like as far as the stop work order went. And so I'm going to introduce We Build the Walls General Counsel Chris Kobach so he can go over all of that for you. Thank you. Thanks, Dustin. Uh, those of you <clears throat> who uh, were here later last night might have noticed that uh, we started moving machines back onto the site. The, um, there was approximately a 36-hour uh, delay in our work. It, roughly 4 o'clock, uh, day before yesterday, is when we received a stop work order from the city, and then we got things going at about 6 a.m. this morning. Uh, the stop work order was lifted by the city yesterday at 4 o'clock, but since we didn't have any of the machinery on site at that point, uh, we decided to wait until this morning to stop. The uh, relevant work permits were issued by the city uh, this morning at approximately 10 a.m. And uh, the, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, we actually applied for permits last week and we were told that our applications were, were set and ready to go and we were told to uh, uh, begin, we asked if we could begin the work on Friday and we were told by the city inspector that we could begin the work. And on Tuesday, the city uh, looked at one of the applications, thought they needed more information for that application and we were happy to provide it. We did provide additional information, more detailed site plan, et cetera. Uh, you may have heard a, a statement from someone from the city um, when that stop work permit was issued that, that they thought the, uh, the project was not in compliance with city ordinances. That statement by the city was incorrect. The city now agrees. There is no or violation of any ordinance uh, in the city of Sunland Park. Uh, they, they had misread uh, an ordinance. They, they didn't misread the ordinance. They applied an ordinance that doesn't, that doesn't apply to this type of property uh, or to this type of construction. So we had done our homework. Uh, long before we began this project and our homework was correct uh, there is no uh, no no ordinance that in any way conflicts with this project and therefore a variance was not required uh, but we did go ahead and get the uh, work permits and provide the additional information so we had about a 36 hour uh, delay and of course we're back up and running now had we not had that delay uh, we would have been about to the top there where the wall is going to deadhead into the uh, that, that cliff on the side of the mountain um, our hope is now that we're back up and running, and, and Tommy Fisher can speak more about this. I'm going to get. Uh, we'll, it will be happy to answer questions. I'll be talking Brian Colfage and Tommy Fisher. Uh, but our hope is that in two days uh, we will be up there where we would have otherwise been uh, right now. Uh, we are going to be having a, a ceremony, a dedication kind of event later today, which uh, Dustin can tell you more about. But uh, just a quick couple of comments about this site. Those of you who are from the region know that this is one of the hottest smuggling areas. Uh, in in this in the El Paso sector, uh, you had human smuggling down here in the valley, drug smuggling on the paths across the side of the hill. Um, we we decided therefore that we weren't just going to build something on the flat ground like the uh, the U.S. government has typically done in the past. We were at the side of the mountain that required an extraordinary contractor, extraordinary engineering, and extraordinary to do what the federal government doesn't usually do, which is build up the side of a mountain. Uh, the, this project ascends 310 vertical feet, uh, so it's truly extraordinary in that regard. It's uh, all weathering steel, 75-year steel, as opposed to the 25-year life, lifespan of the typical steel. But Tommy Fisher can say more about that. Um, but one last point before I turn it over to Brian Colfage, who's, who's the founder of this entire effort, is uh, how quickly we were able to move. Uh, we learned in the first week of April that the property owner here was suffering uh, incredible theft, violence, and trafficking across his property, and uh, desperately wanted a wall, and that would be open to rebuild the wall coming in. And here we are in the last week of May, and the wall is, uh, is virtually completed and, and will be completed in two days. So it shows how quickly a private organization can identify the problem, take the steps necessary to mobilize resources and get to the site, and then complete the project. And so there's so many impressive things about this wall. Uh, and, and Tommy will fill you in on those details, but one of the most impressive things to me is the speed with which we mobilized. Um, the federal government can do impressive things with its huge resources. We don't have the resources they do, but we do have agility and speed and determination, and that's what I hope you see on display when you look at this wall. Uh, and with, without further ado, uh, I'd like to turn it over now to our founder, uh, the man who really made it all possible, Brian Kolbosch.
Uh, before I get, one more thing, guys, before Brian gets started. Um, we've made, I, as a group, we huddled up this morning. We decided that we were going to cancel this afternoon's rally. Uh, we, 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 we would still have some ceremonies, but we're not making it open to the public because, once again, we're an active construction zone. Um, so uh, we, we, we hope that, that uh, we, our, our, our mission has always been to get the wall completed as quickly as possible. So we're postponing that rally so the construction crews will be able to work around the clock and get the job done. So. Will all these mics still pick it up? Thank you all for coming out today and uh, witnessing this project that, you know, this is a project that was started by the American people who all believed in border security and who believe there is a crisis down here. A lot of people ask about uh, how did we get here today? How, how did we find this landowner? How do we identify this exact spot where we're building? Um, over the last 57 days from the, is, when, is when we started this project, from the time I set here, I went actually rolled across into Mexico and rolled back in in my wheelchair. And at that point, I knew this was a bad area. And we sat down with the landowner. He explained that of his struggle of living here and working here over the last many, many, many years of having to live in fear. He has to carry a gun around loaded with rounds in the chamber 24 7. Um, he told me the story of when he went to Home Depot last year. Bought a brand new barbecue, put it out on his property on the other side of this hill. Within four hours, it was stolen. Uh, we started looking deeper into the problems that were going on around here. At that same time, you guys probably all saw the videos popping up on Facebook from the, the members who were on the other side of this hill, uh, posting of all the, the, all the migrants coming across, uh, drug smugglers. At that time, we knew that this was going to be a spot for we build a wall, and this, we knew that we were going to have to build here. Uh, that's our mission. We wanted to have the largest impact. We. Sorry about that. We, we had a lot of property owners and we mapped out every single property owner on the southern border. And we've been networking on the border, going from state to state, property owner to property owner, figuring out who we could have an impact with and who had issues. Um, in the current pipeline right now, we have about 10 properties where we can do this at. 10 that are ready to go. Um, we have many more, there's probably hundreds that we just have to go out and make contact with. Um, you know, 57 days ago when I was on this property, I didn't think we were gonna get this done this fast. We started interviewing contractors. Uh, one of the first ones that popped up was, was Tommy Fisher and Fisher Industries. Uh, I saw what they did. We immediately sent Chris out to Arizona to inspect their facilities, inspect, inspect what they were doing. And it became very clear to us that this company, Fisher Industries, knew what they were doing and they had the power and determination to get the job done. And they, they were very, very similar to like what we were doing. They were motivated and uh, very eager. Uh, Tommy immediately said, said he could do this in a, just a couple days. And we're like, nah, is this, you know, can you really do this in a couple days? And there was a lot on the line. And you know, Tommy basically explained his process. And you know, we, we got a bid from Tommy and you know, he, he did an excellent job putting together all this, all the paperwork and everything for it to move forward. We had a, well, we didn't have to clear it. We, we informed the United States government of exactly what we were doing. Uh, the president was briefed on what we were doing. The Department of Homeland Security was briefed on what we were doing. The IBWC was 100% briefed last week on what we were doing. They were called here in El Paso. Everyone knew what was going on. Um, regardless of what we meant here, they're probably not going to admit it because it is a controversial subject. Uh, last week when we came down here, you know, Tommy started getting his equipment in place and ready to go. And we wanted to keep this quiet because we've had death threats against our, our team members. And we take these death threats serious. And uh, this is one of the most important things. We, we couldn't risk having an international incident down here. And the media was really hitting us hard because they're like, what's going on? We haven't heard anything from you guys. 
there's a lot of misinformation out there about fake news that we're misappropriating funds and stuff like that. It's 100% not true. As you can see behind me, we, we, we just built this wall with these funds. Um, so that is why we kept this whole project a secret. Uh, we weren't going to risk someone's life down here dealing with the cartels. And the Juarez cartel is one of the most ruthless cartels. And you know, I've, I've faced a lot of trauma in my life. I've faced people like them in Iraq, and I wasn't going to risk anyone's life. We kept it quiet. Tommy came down here, and we started getting this thing prepped out. Um, on Friday, you know, the city came down here. Everything was ready to go, and we started building. You know, and as you can see, this thing moved fast. Tommy and his team was working nonstop, day and night, to put up this, these walls, as you can see right here. And they did an incredible job. And, you know, Tommy, where you at? Come out here. Yeah, I just wanna, I wanna thank you for your, your hard work and dedication. Um, you know, you're part of our team. And you, 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 initially, you weren't, you were just some contractor guy. You know what the heck you're doing. And, you know, it's people like you who, who ultimately change this country and make it a better place. And, you know, we didn't want someone who was just down here looking to get rich. You know, Tommy's down here because he loves this country. He believes in the mission and he ultimately wants to make it a better place and make these communities a better place. We want drugs coming into our communities. We have the, the, the angel parents, Steve Ronenbach, Miriam Mendoza, and they're on our board. And when I started this project and they, they approached me and we started talking, you know, how can you look someone in the eyes that just lost their family member who shouldn't have been even killed to begin with? They were killed at the hands of someone here illegally. And I have young children, and that touched my heart deeply. And that just gave me the motivation, it gave our team the motivation to see this project through. And it's the stories of the American people that really drive this. It's the stories of the American people who donated for this. It was that they were donating with their money. They didn't have to donate. They pay taxes, but they were willing to take that extra step to give us money to put up border wall and to protect our communities. And that's what this project's about. And Tommy, you did an amazing job. I thank for everything you do, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, guys. Well, you can't say any more than what Brian um, said you know over memorial day week and we took it serious and you know brian's put his life on the line and you can see the sacrifices he's made for this country and i've been going on a lot on fox and you know i'm an expert in construction and our company is there's 1500 employees that are very motivated and when the government agencies tell you that you can't do it or they tell you you're full of baloney 1500 people from the fisher industries team stood up and was so proud and honored for we build the wall to give us a shot to do this. And um, we have you know, the ability to build in the multi-billions and build miles and miles and miles. So my hope is, is if we can serve our country this way, and I've met a lot of border agents, and i give you just one quick story. It was day one we started moving dirt here, and the head sector chief came out, and I don't wanna mention names and stuff. He said, sir, what are you doing? I said, I'm hopefully giving you the best border security system that you'll ever see. It's not just a fence. It's a road, it's lighting, it's technology. It's something that works because if you just have a fence by itself, it's very hard to patrol what happens to a fence. You can have a ladder, you can climb it. If you have a road by itself and you just have the lights and no barrier, it'd be no different than you walking out on the interstate and there's a road, what's gonna happen? You just walk right into live traffic. You gotta have them all together. And he told me that he, he had asked and the other people on his team that they have asked for this border to be secured for years and years and he was told by the government it couldn't be done and I said well we're gonna you know those days are over so my hope is is the American people can see this what American pride American grit does when you come together as a team and for me it was a chance to turn back the clock and go back to working construction I was on the machines day one and it was no different than I got turned back 20 years ago and work with our team, not as a president and a CEO, as a worker hand in hand, as an American, uh, trying to build something better. And so with that, um, we are very determined. Uh, we'll continue to work with Build the Wall. My hope is, is that they'll raise a billion dollars and we'll show, and I believe in my heart, that I can build the U.S. government with their help and if the, the Americans, you know, don't donate uh, 
the money that we have different uh, designs to work in the Rio Grande the right way where we can build a flood wall along with border protection. So you kill two birds with one stone. We can actually clean the river, build a backfilled wall, give the agents an elevated view, and build something that will last 150 years. And the other, th <laughs> and the other three states, no different than using the baller, is everybody in America demands that they get to drive on a paved road. Why shouldn't our agents? So, so, you know, when we stood down here, the agents, when they had to cover this half mile up to the mountain, they said no matter what they do, it was 20 minutes to 30 minutes to intersect anybody or to even see any threat. Today, they'll have the biggest tower after they take over on top of that perch that they can see 15 to 20 miles into Mexico and all over the U.S. And then they'll have a road that if there is a problem where they need to be, from this point, you have my word, in 30 seconds, they're at the top of the hill. And that's what I hope that both sides of the aisle will see, that this just isn't a wall or it's just not a fence. It's a border security system that will protect our southern border. And it's been the probably out of all the great jobs Fisher's done over the 25 years I've run the company, this has probably been the most challenging the highest quality with the fastest speed ever done. So again, I thank Build the Wall, Brian, for your courage and your service, what you've done for us. And hopefully with, our ex with my expertise and our company's expertise, we can serve this country the same way, maybe just in a little different manner. So thank you. Thank you, Tommy. I, I mean, the proof is in the pudding when you look at how quickly this wall could, was constructed the work that Tommy Fisher has done speaks for itself. I and mean, all everybody at Fisher Industries, we are uh, so honored to be able to work with you and uh, have you work on this project with us, Tommy. Thank you. Uh, I know you guys have a lot of questions, so I'm going to give you a, a quick breakdown of what the uh, rest of the agenda is going to look like. Um, we're going to open it up. I'm going to bring out uh, We Build the Wall Communications Director, Jennifer Lawrence. She's going to uh, moderate a quick Q&A with Brian, Tommy, and Chris. Uh, please keep these questions as, this, this is your opportunity to ask any technical questions, uh, any questions about the process and how everything went down. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Jennifer. She'll call on you guys. Please wait your turn to uh, ask a question, but we're happy to have you guys take questions to Brian, Tommy, and Chris. Hi everyone, I just wanted to say thank you to Brian and Build the Wall and everyone who was involved. This is an amazing project and I'm just so honored to be a part of it. So who has questions? You sir. Yes, can you please tell me about the permit that you needed to build this uh, part of the, uh, the wall? Yeah, the, um, it, one of the interesting things about a project like this is, uh, you know, we all live in various towns and you have, if you want to build a house, you get a building permit for a house. If you want to put in a swimming pool, you get the relevant permit for your swimming pool. So when we looked uh, through the codes of, uh, of Sunland Park, there wasn't a uh, border barrier permit uh, that was easily accessible and say, oh, that's the one we fill out. So uh, we, we had discussions with the city and ultimately they concluded that uh, a, a building permit, which you know most people when you see building permit would think, oh, that's for a building. But this is a structure that's built. So they, they asked us to get a building permit for the wall itself, a uh, building permit for the cement pedestals that the lights stand on, and also a grading permit. So those are the, the three permits. And, and as I mentioned earlier, no variance was needed because we are entirely consistent with all of the codes, uh, the ordinances of, uh, of Sunland Park. Next question. Uh, yes, Chris, I'm Robert Logan with K-5. You know, there's some people in the community who said that this is a, kind of a prop, a stunt, because it is a physical barrier, but it'll do little in the long run in terms of the larger issue. Uh, just your, your response to that. Yeah. I, uh, Put it this way, if you ask me, and I'm, I'm sure Brian would say the same thing, if you said, would you choose to build a half mile to fill this gap in the, in the El Paso metropolitan area, or would you rather build 20 miles um, out in the desert, maybe by Columbus, New Mexico? Um, we would have said, without question, we'd rather build right here, because, it's prox because of its proximity to the metropolitan area, it, it stops so much more. This is such a hotbed of trafficking. It's estimated by the agents over 100 on average, over 100 migrants per day are brought through here, and over $100,000 in drugs are brought along the paths up top. So the impact of this half mile 
is far greater than the impact of 20 miles in other parts of the border. And so uh, we, it certainly is not a, uh, a stunt or a prop because anyone who's been here before knows that all you had to do was go from that parking lot on the Mexican side to this parking lot on the American side, hop out of a vehicle there, hop into a vehicle here, and, and hundreds of people could do that every night. So we, we will eliminate, once the uh, gate goes up with the Border Patrol and the IBWC control, uh, that won't happen anymore. The uh, cartel smuggling paths up top, uh, if you go up there, some of you have already been up there, you can see them clear as day. They're, they're well-traveled, uh, smooth paths that people are we're walking on every night. So uh, this project, it makes a huge impact. And one more point, it's not just this half mile. We make the El Paso wall more effective. So a smuggler in the middle of Juarez looking north at the El Paso wall might say, well, that's, that's pretty imposing, but he might laugh at it because he can say, I can walk or drive two miles to the west, and I can just go through the gap at Monument One. So by putting the, by filling in the gap, by standing in the gap and building the wall, that makes a huge difference because now the El Paso wall is so much more effective. It, it can't be so easily circumvented. So the impact of this half mile, again, is far greater than 20 miles out in the middle of nowhere where there's very little traffic. I want to add something to that. Yeah. And also, I, I posted a picture um, on my Twitter the other day, there was a while well, we're doing construction on, I think it was Monday or Sunday. There was a group of migrants who came down from the hill. Or, I'm not really sure what they were. They they were trying to come into the, the U.S. Probably 20 of them. They came off the ridge. They started coming down. They saw the wall, and they turned right around and went right back up into the mountain. And that that was that proves the efficiency that walls work to funnel people back. It funnels people to where they need to go. And this wall is not about stopping immigration. This wall is about legal immigration. We want people to use the front door and come to this country legally. Um, there's no reason to use the back door. And you know we agree that there is with you know, our immigration system as a whole, but uh, this is the first step of discussion. So to, to coming together, meeting in the middle, and getting the problem solved. Rather scurrilous accusations about the city leadership in some of this park, mentioning perhaps bribery by cartels. Any any response now? To yeah, that? I, that was a question. It says, our worst, who, who was paid off by cartels? Question mark Was anyone working with cartels? Because of the history that Southern Park had with uh, you know their corruption, and it's it's big. It's a big issue. We we talked to a lot of people in the government who who have confirmed all all our suspicions about. You know what's good, what goes on on the border. The cartels have a big influence financially on people. It's proven, and uh, I thought what. And let me let me add something to that. I, I just want to thank the city of Sunland Park for working with us. Now, I, I you you all have lived here in this area far better than we do, but um, I can say working with the officials of Sunland Park this week, uh, they worked very quickly to make sure that we, that they were able to review this project and get whatever information they need reviewed within 24 hours. And that's a process they, that they would normally maybe take two weeks to do. So I, I want to thank the, the engineering staff and the uh, administrative staff at, at Sunland Park for once there was the question of, uh, of, of, of which whether the right permits had been obtained. And, and, there, and like I said earlier, uh, when you look at a project like this, it's not entirely clear which permits are applicable and which ones aren't. Um, but they worked with us very quickly, uh, and they agreed with our initial uh, read of the ordinances that there was nothing in the project that in any way conflicted with it. So I, I really want to applaud the hard work of Sunland Park City officials over the last 36 hours in clarifying any uh, any issues. And uh, that's why we're back at work, and that's why the machines are running right now. Great. Politico? Oh, never mind. I'm not with Politico. No, I was talking to him. I got it wrong. Sorry. Um, I'm going to have two more questions as well. Monday. Will projects like this one, or the other 10 projects that you mentioned, have an impact or stem the flow of immigrants? And the second part of that question, where do you anticipate those 10 projects will be? Here, Well, the impact of these, of these walls, like we, our original plan was mile by mile, section by section, for half the cost. Um, 
These walls are force multiplier for the Border Patrol. The Border Patrol is under understaffed right now. They're overworked. And frankly, they have to, to, before this wall was here, they might have to have a, a couple of patrols patrol this area. This wall frees them up now, and they can go patrol other areas. So it acts as a, for, a force multiplier. Um, we look at it, you know, the, the border wall is, the, our border is porous, and look at it as like a hose, a leaky hose. But when you patch one hole, it's going to leak somewhere else. But it starts funneling people to just these, these other holes. And so those border patrol agents no longer have to worry about this hole. They can go focus on another hole and, and, and spread out there more. And uh, Border Patrol confirmed this with us that it is, it is, it is a force multiplier. And uh, yeah, what was your up? The second part of your question? Can extend the flow on the sounds? I, I can answer that. Any other 10 projects going to be? Oh, no. Uh, we're not discussing anything on the, the future project because of the issues with death threats on our team. So it, it's going to be remain quiet, just like this project was. And uh, when we start uh, completing construction, we, we will roll it out. Right. Regarding the other part of the question, the asylum seekers, so obviously we have a huge flow, you know, over half a million people coming in in this recent wave of caravans, which is predominated by asylum seekers since October 1st. Um, and as Brian said, you patch one hole in the hose, the other holes will leak, but that doesn't mean you don't start by patching this one hole because we have to start patching up all of the holes in the border. Um, but I will say this, um, this one was a particularly easy one for asylum seekers to use. And, and bear in mind when we say asylum seekers, right now, at, on this date in, in May of 2019, we're talking about groups coming from predominantly three countries where 90% of the asylum claims are rejected. They're being deceived by smugglers who tell them, oh yeah, you can get asylum now. And then they're brought up and then they, they are given in the United States and then a court date and then some show up and some don't. But if they do show up, usually the asylum claims are, statistically, most of them are denied because they don't qualify for asylum. But to give you an idea of how easy this one is, we've heard from uh, Border Patrol officers and other people uh, in, who've been in this area that because of the parking lots and because you've got an airport in Juarez, people will fly in to Juarez, drive to this park, Uber it to this parking lot, get another Uber on this side of the parking lot while they're carrying their carry-on luggage still and wearing their nice clothes that they traveled in. And then they come to the United States and they seek asylum after they just took a plane into the safe country of Mexico and then Ubered it here. So that our system, asylum was meant for people who are being persecuted by their governments because of their membership in a particular social group. And those are the exact words of the international definition of asylum. Now it's being manipulated by the cartels to, they just say anyone who's in a, a neighborhood uh, where you, there's poverty or crime, come on up, we'll see, we'll, you'll get your asylum claim. So, respect, respectfully, the scenario you just laid out describing the asylum But if it is closed, if, the, if this border is closed off here, then they're not going to be able to come in and, and present themselves it, it, a demand that the Border Patrol take them and, and process their asylum claim. They'll have to go somewhere else. We want them to go to a port of entry. Trump has rightly asked, and the uh, U.S. Department of Justice has asked, and the Department of Homeland Security, you need to make an asylum claim uh, in a legal way at a port of entry. And so we want to encourage those claims, the legal ones, to be made at ports of entry, not by people streaming across the border and then if they get, get caught they say oh yeah I'm seeking asylum okay so we have time for two more questions and people who haven't asked questions yet please you so the Border Patrol has been on site and the uh, Leadership, both nationally and some of the uh, El Paso sector uh, people have toured the site. The, they, are, they are correct in that they have no, had nothing to do with the building of it. We have consulted and asked opinions on, on the design, but we were proceeding independently. So it, it is correct that they didn't, uh, they, shall we say, part of the organization in building it. However, we've told them this is a turnkey operation. So we want to finish this and then hand them a state of the art. Indeed, I would say this is probably the best section of border fence. It's undoubtedly the best section of border fence on the entire U.S.-Mexico border. And then it's up to them to decide. Do they want to have their lights on all night long? Do they want to only want to put the lights on when they think there's a threat? Do they want to, what, how do they want to react to the sensors, the underground sensors that Tommy's team has put in place? Um, what do they want to do with the video data that's captured from the state-of-the-art camera? So it's up to them to decide going forward what, how they want to use all of this high-tech security. But 
the intention all along has been to give the Border Patrol the keys to the car, so to speak, and let them decide how to use it. But I guarantee there is an immense amount of enthusiasm among all the Border Patrol officials we've talked about, talked to, because this is, this is 75 year steel, not 25 year steel. This is the only place where they can uh, drive on a paved road. This is the only place where they've got a wall that actually climbs 310 vertical feet. So, and that, that eagle's nest up there, that perch where you can see that vehicle. If you haven't been up there, we'll try to get you a view at some point. It is extraordinary. It is one of, it, it will probably end up be, being the best uh, observation point on the entire southern border. I'm not aware of any, anyone that's better, and I've seen a lot of the border. Uh, it's, it's a virtual parking lot for about five or six vehicles up there. They're very, the people we have talked about, in, officials in the Border Patrol who saw that site, were blown away by how much they can see up there. Um, and Tommy, maybe you can comment on it. You had a discussion with one of them. So we had officials from Washington, and when they came, it's a game changer is what they said. An absolute game changer. I don't want to discuss their technology or not, but um, with their ability, they can see 20 miles. And my point is, is if you don't prove that you can build through the mountains and everything there, and one of the questions, if, if people can be told, hey, the border's loose and you can still come in or whatever, we want to set the standard again that there's wall and security system everywhere so you come to the right spot. We're all immigrants in this country. And um, no one from my company or anyone that works, I probably have one of the largest Hispanic workforce in the Southwest. We probably have 400 Hispanics working for us and they're great workers. Um, probably 100% percent Hispanic worker put these fences together in Coolidge, Arizona, and we have multiple Hispanics working on the, you know, right here with our team. So my big point is, is we're one big family here. We welcome everyone, but we want to welcome them the right way to get here. You can hang your head proud because we do have borders that we all can feel part of. Great. Cedar? I have a question for each of you real quick. Mr. Fisher, when you were talking about both sides of the aisle, what kind well, the political message I'm hoping will send, Congress. Yeah, yes. Congress or senators, if I'm talking to a Democrat, and they've talked a lot about technology and infrastructure. You're standing on two thirds, infrastructure on this road, technology and the lights, the cameras that you don't see that are watching but us right works. now, and it works. And also on the other side, if they're very against a barrier, here's the barrier. But on the Republican side, the Republicans want all three. So I'm hoping that when they can see what border agents truly need, this isn't a Republican or a Democrat thing. This is an American thing. This is for our agents. And so I wish both sides of the aisle would actually talk to the agents that work and put their lives on the line, because those are the people that are giving us a hug and say thank you very much for doing it. Um, yeah, so the uh, the intention is to uh, transfer a, a permanent easement so that they would have 24-7 access and control uh, of this property to the uh, United States government and indeed the, uh, the, the, the dedication or rather the conveyance of the easement uh, has already been has already occurred and is being registered I believe today or tomorrow uh, in the county. Uh, the, but again, it's, we, we aren't trying to tell the Border Patrol what to do. Our, our objective is to simply give them this gift yeah, so and let them like, decide what to do with it. And access, but it's not a property transfer and ownership and liability. And that kind of if the Border Patrol uh, says or the, or the Department of Homeland Security indicates to We Build the Wall that uh, a full transfer of the t title in the property itself is, is more desirable, then we will do that. We are entirely at their service, whatever, if they want an easement, if they want a title in the property, we're here to help. And that's what this whole project is. We would like to help the federal government. And for Brian, this first experiment was a success. When you got it built, you dealt with those political issues, but it seemed like in order to get there, you had to turn all of your supporters on the Pacific Silver Park and kind of go after them with pitchforks. What did you learn from that experience? And would you apply that same tactic going down the road if you well, I think, uh, you know, each, each project is different. And, uh, you know, from what we've, what we've faced leading up to this point, uh, I don't think anything's off the table. I mean, this is, uh, 
the security of our nation is, is at risk here. And I, I've, I've said it before, you know, how do you, how do you tell these, these family members staying behind you? You know, look at, look at that. They love their sons. Uh, where's Brian Terry's father, our brother and sister? Right there. Uh, Brian Terry's mother, right there. No, no, sister. sister, sorry. Mom behind you. Mom, son behind you. There you go. How do, how do you tell them that, you know, what happened to them, border agent killed? You know, this is, he didn't have the protection he should have had. You know, it's, just, it's ridiculous. This is why we're doing this. It's, um, so how, the method that we use to get this done, I think is we have to take extreme measures sometimes. And you know, I've been attacked with pitchforks myself this entire, entire time, fake news. And I think we've all seen it, you know, it goes on and on and on, just like constant lies, uh, death threats against my family. And you know, no, we weren't doing anything like that. We, we just wanted people to reach out and, and show support. And there was an article that came out locally and it said that people were being friendly, calling, expressing their, you know, their, their emotions with this, with this project and saying they wanted it to be built and don't hold it up. And they weren't going, acting ridiculous, saying they wanted to kill anybody or they're gonna, you know, threaten people. It wasn't like that, it was just perfectly uh, clean and. You know, just a protest. And that's uh, one of our rights in the United States. Right. I'm just going to take over the maintenance. Hold on a second. Yeah. No, you probably already asked a question. You've answered it. Yeah. 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 Ye
and we did not clear the opt-in process until late April. So no matter how you look at this, from the moment we first started raising money uh, on the GoFundMe, less than six months, and this is what we were able to accomplish, it is a truly incredible feat, and it took a lot of people to be able to make it happen. Um, Brian's leadership, Chris's leadership and guidance and legal guidance, Tommy's incredible building ability, but we also have a lot of people who stepped up early on and helped us continue to build the momentum that was necessary. Now, one of, one of the things that serves as the most potent reminder of what we did here and why our mission was so important was the involvement of our angel families on our board. I've known Steve Ronenbeck and Marianne Mendoza for a long time. I've seen their pain, I've seen them, their speeches, and I've seen their passion for this issue. And uh, every step along the way, they have served to motivate us, to push us, um, and to inspire us. And so uh, it is with my great pleasure that I'm going to uh, bring each one of them out individually to talk for a couple of minutes. And we'll start with you, Marianne. Thank you very much. And I was very honored when I got the call to be on the advisory board because this and every wristband is a reminder, this is the result of illegal immigration. This is the ultimate sacrifice of American citizens. Um, this is a grain of sand on a beach of the American victims of illegal alien crime. Over 4,300 a year are killed over 70,000 a year die from drug overdoses. Over 100,000 Americans are assaulted or other crimes committed on them by illegal aliens. Identity theft, rape, um, it, the list just goes on and on and on. And so angelfamilies.com was formed and we try and bring more awareness to the problem. And to be a witness of this, to be a part of this organization and and just to stand next to every one of these members who are on the board and know that the American people can step up, the American people can do something that our useless Congress and, and the swamp in D.C. will not do. They continue to act like this isn't a problem. I'm reality. Every angel family is reality. And thank God that President Trump brought us forward and made, made the public aware of angel families and the pain they go through. My son's life was snuffed out in 2014 by a drunk repeat illegal alien criminal who was allowed to stay in our country after committing crimes and a judge basically slapped him on the wrist and said, have a nice life in the USA. This is not the way that this country was founded and like they've said before me speaking today, we are all in support of legal immigration. Illegal immigration is what we don't accept. It's a criminal act in itself and we need to stop the flow and I just think that this is a beautiful thing. It's affected every angel family who's present today to see this actually have happened. And I wanna thank all the Americans who donated to this. Keep donating, because like Brian said, there's 10 more projects and we need your help and we need the determination and the guts that the American people have to keep this going. Hi, right, Steve Ronenbeck, come up here, buddy. You know, January 22nd, 2015 was probably the worst day of my life. Um, and today, thanks to Brian and Chris Kobach, Tom Tancredo, Sheriff Clark, um, Tommy, especially Tommy, I'll tell you what, I got here Sunday morning, by Sunday night. Um, I had probably two or three truckloads of Tommy's guys that, that stopped by my motorhome and wanted to, I, I put a banner of Grant on the and they stopped, and, and they wanted to. They wanted to hear Grant's story, um, and that's the type of people that that Tommy has. Um, I want to thank Tommy especially for for that and for what he's done. Today is a good day, and it's a great day because guess what? America did this, the American people did this, and they did it out of their own pockets. They didn't depend on the government. They did it out of their own pocket. Um, you've heard Brian and Chris and everybody talk about this quarter. Later today, if some of you go up to the top, you can actually see there's a road up on the top of this ridge on the other side in Mexico. But it is so easy. If they don't drop them off here, they could drive on this, this road up top 
drop them off and then drive back down and get another load of, of illegals. There's never been one of us that has said all illegal immigrants are bad. But we've all said that we want them to come here legally. Um, and, and today, this is just going to help some, some of these people come here legally. Um, Grant was executed by an illegal alien January 22nd, 2015 over a pack of cigarettes. And today, um, I'm going to tell you, this is amazing. And the American people need to know, everybody that donated needs to know, that we kept our promises. Brian kept his promise to the American people. And for somebody who literally got blown up for his country, he's still serving. And I respect him more than he'll ever know. So when we started this process, Brian can tell you about how much heat he's taken. It's a, it's a lot. So uh, as somebody who monitors the stories that are written and the things that have been said about him, about other members of our team, when we start to figure out who could help us in specific areas on this, we knew we had to have people who were fighters, who were tough as nails, and who understood the issue. And uh, so we started to reach out to some pretty incredible people. One of those people uh, who's really helped us understand the law enforcement angle. Um, when Tommy Fisher talks about the Border Patrol agents, we basically tried to come up with a, their wish list and deliver it to them with the paved road, with the perch, with the lighting, right? We wanted to give, this is truly built for the agents. And one of the guys who really helped us understand that is Sheriff David Clark. And so I'm gonna let him come up here and speak for a couple minutes. Thank you, appreciate it. Look, any talk about illegal immigration, legal immigration starts with border security. If you do not fortify the border, it makes no difference what other changes you make in this multifaceted issue of immigration in the United States of America. Because you can deport all the people you want, you can take all the people who overstay their visas and kick them out, but if your border is not secure, they're coming right back in. And some of the people, who you've heard from, the angel parents, the angel moms, the angel families, they can tell you. These individuals have already been deported only to come right back in. Now there's only one person in Washington, D.C. that has a sense of urgency about border security. One person and it's President Donald Trump. He understands it. He speaks about it every day. And he's trying to move Congress who does not have the will to do anything about this. And we're going into an election year 2020 they're not going to do anything about it. As far as I'm concerned, there are two types of people in, these wor in this world, two types of people. There are talkers and there are doers. The people in Washington, D.C., and I'm talking about on the Hill, they talk about immigration. They talk all around it, right? You hear them all the time. Well, we support uh, the President Trump and his border wall, but we, we are against illegal immigration but everything's followed by a but there's an excuse this group together and this shows the determination of the american people them a lot enough we really can't never underestimate the will and determination of the american people to step up in a time of crisis this border issue is at a crisis level and the american people have always stepped up in a time of crisis for instance earthquakes wildfires, floods, right? Tornadoes. The American people have dug into their pocket and done their part to get the resources in to fix the problem and that's what's happened here. One man's vision, but Brian knows and he's already talked about it. it, takes a team of people. I was honored to get the call from Brian to be a part of this to help message. But really this is about the American people and that's why I'm so proud of this thing. All right, and all the other questions I think that we're hearing, again, we're talking around the issue. This is about the American people and what it means to have border security along our southern border and our northern border, but basically the problem is at the southern border. All right, this is just the start. It's not the end, but I'll tell you what, it's highly symbolic. The work that went into this and in a very short period of time. I was blown away when I heard yesterday that people who know this type of work 
said this type of project would take the federal government two, two and a half years and cost about $40 million. Look at the time that we've done it in and look at the cost. Folks, we know how to get shit done. Thank you very much. All right, the uh, next member I'm going to bring up, he, uh, he spent more time on the border than just about anybody I know. He was so passionate about it that he ran for president on a single issue, which was illegal immigration and, and, and the immigration problem. His service in Washington, D.C., his service in Colorado uh, is exemplary. And on this issue, he has been a leader and a guide for us in this project. I remember early on he said, uh, I'm, I'm really eager to do this, but boy, you guys don't know what you're getting into. And I, I think we've pleasantly surprised Tom, and uh, I think our ability to come together and get it done. So it is a great honor. I, uh, I, I get a little starstruck by this man, but I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to bring out Tom Tancredo. Thank you, buddy. Well, you know, it's really fascinating, and uh, it is spent a lot of time, uh, it's certainly my political career, devoted to trying to do something about the problems attendant to illegal immigration in the United States. And that's been a long career and it's been a, a, a lot of talk, absolutely a talk in Washington. Believe me, I, I contributed to that. <laughs> Millions of, of, uh, of words probably written and, uh, and spoken on the issue. But, but here is the culmination of that to a large extent. For me, I, I have never seen, I've never been a part of anything. Nothing I've done in Congress, not running for president on the issue, no matter what. Nothing compares with the actual practical application of our concerns. Here it is. You know, the, certainly uh, the, the Corps of Engineers said, can't be done. The media, many parts of the media said, they'll never do it. It's a ruse. It's a fraud. It, you know, all these people are, are just looking to, to get money and all this stuff. All these horrible things that were said about Brian. Um, and, and there were, of course, people, po politicians on both sides, may I tell you, on both sides who don't want it to be done, who didn't want it to work. It's not that they didn't think it could. It, it's not that they challenged the veracity of the people who were involved. It's they didn't want it because of the sim, because of what it represents, the ability to actually do something about this issue in a very practical way. They don't want it. I assure you, when somebody talked about the fact that this was a bipartisan issue, I think Tommy was talking about it. It's about it is, and for the to, to a great extent, it was partisan opposition to immigration reform. It wasn't just Democrats, and it certainly was Republicans also. I, I guarantee you I was as surprised as anyone when I first went into Congress in 1998 by the amount of opposition that was in my own party. And, and if you brush away all of the words that were used, uh, in, in reality it came down to, hey, we get a lot of money from interests that are benefited by illegal immigration. And on the other side, of course, they recognized it was political power that came about as a result of illegal immigration. So there was this cabal, in a way. So this is the value of what we're standing in front of here. It shows them all. They were all wrong. It could be done. It was done. And it's going to be done over and over and over again because of these guys. Thank you very much. Who's next? I will. But there's a lot of people to recognize. We also have some additional people coming in. They're making their way um, from all over the world uh, to be here with us today. Uh, there, there has been some issues with uh, travel. I definitely want to recognize the Terry family. Um, they, they, uh, several of you guys came down to some of our town halls. And uh, like I said, you guys serve as the potent reminder of why this issue, why we're so passionate about it, and why we work so hard to get this done. And uh world to us that you guys have been out here supporting us and been here with us. Um, I, we, we have several angel families here. I, I personally am not familiar with everybody's stories. Um, I know that they all lost loved ones. And uh, it, it, it's almost a sad commentary that 
I've met so many angel families uh, uh, as part of this process. Their stories, I, I know how personal they are, but they almost blend together because there's so many of them. It's like uh, Marianne says, it's a grain of sand. And, and sadly, they welcome someone into their ranks every single day. And, uh, and, 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 and so being able to accomplish something that, that we've heard a lot of talk about whether this is just symbolic, and it definitely has symbolic value and it definitely brings awareness to the issue, but this will have a real impact. It's why we chose this site specifically. So do you have anything more you want to say? Yeah, I just want to thank everyone who donated to this project, yeah. uh, anyone out there who does watch this. So ultimately, this is the people's project. They donated. They didn't have to get their money. But it wouldn't be possible if they didn't donate to that GoFundMe back in December when we raised $20 million in 20 days. So without those contributions, none of this would be happening today. It's, it's been and people putting their faith in me, to trust me, even with all the fake news that says that uh, I'm... I'm buying yachts and jets and flying all over the damn place. Uh, it's completely untrue. And as you can see here, we're, we're putting this money to good use. We built the wall. We built it. The people built yeah, it. Uh, right. We got it done, and there's many more that are going to be built just like this. And it's it's only because of these donations. So it's very important for people that they want to keep this going, keep donating. We're going to not stop. We're going to keep this going. And people who don't think it has an impact, uh, you can say, yeah, walls don't work. Uh, is there anyone out there who could even remember the time that there was another suicide bomber in the, the country of Israel? No one can remember it. It's because the moment they put up a, a border wall, uh, the, their illegal crossings went down 99.9%. They haven't had any suicide bombers or any type of blast like that go off in their country since they installed that wall. Uh, walls work and also we are here today with all these media having the conversation and it's it's in the news we're keeping it in the front of the media and you know this this is working and we're having a conversation and bringing people together to have that conversation to meet in the middle hopefully one day and address this problem thank you so we're gonna uh, like I said before, we are not having a rally this afternoon, although we will have some ceremonies. There will be additional people available um, who I'm sure you guys will have questions for. In the meantime, if you guys would like a tour or you, if you would like an interview, please reach out to myself or Jen and we would be happy to coordinate that for you. So, uh, if people want to uh, stay down here on this end of the concrete, you can. They're about to start pouring down on that end of the concrete, so please uh, don't go past this first pole here and just stay around this corner if you want to be near the wall. Thanks. Brian's literally just going to stand.